I am unashamed. What about you? So uh, I preached. We're a little bit behind. I try to kind of partner our whatever we're doing our study on the podcast with what we're preaching at WFR because that way I can get some good sermon ideas like I did from Jace's uh, from our last podcast. So I can use that when I get there. But uh, so I did. So I just did the genealogy this past Sunday because we're just cranking the book out. And it was really interesting because, you know, I made the whole point that we've talked about on here about the idea of that grace was kind of all spread through it because you had those women mentioned, you know, that how this really scandalous, you know, situations that they brought into the lineage of Christ. So I kind of made that point that really from the beginning, Matthew was talking about grace. But I was like, you know, why do people look back anyway? But when you, if you think about it, and I made this point, Dad, that if, you know, if Phyllis's son had not been interested in his genealogy, Grant, you know, my nephew, your grandson, if he hadn't been interested in looking back, they never would have found us. That's true. And, uh, you know, so I thought, man, because when they started the process, they had no idea that, you know, that the guy who she thought her whole life was her dad was her dad. But then when they looked at the DNA and the genealogy, just sort of like when Matthew started this book, you look back and you thought, wait a minute, something we thought was true our whole lives, something's not right. Well, she had to change her thinking by saying, he's not my dad, the fellow, but he's my stepdad. Right. My, and, and My dad is down in the woods over there. That's right. And put on top of that, Dad, that he had been dead for nine years. Mm-hmm. So, so in other words, it wasn't like you could go back and say, hey, I just found this out and have a conversation with him. He was, he's been gone a while. That's right. And so it really put her in an interesting position to then have to start searching and looking to find. And when I was doing some study on not only that chapter, but also our, what we're studying here in Matthew, it was, it was interesting because this Chuck Swindoll, who I've been reading his commentary, he said, how many of you even know the name of your great-grandmother and great-grandfather? And I thought to myself, you know, just four generations, most people go back. Most people don't have any idea. No. They couldn't just name them, you know, easily or quickly unless you spend a little time looking back. So it does show you how quickly in terms of human generations and human time, how quickly we forget as, you know, even our fairly recent past. I mean, within 75 to 100 years yeah. of your past, you just lose it. So I thought it was interesting that, thinking about all that in context of why Matthew thought it was important to put Jesus's genealogy, you know, in there from a perspective of him being the king, you know, cause he was the king of Kings. Yep. So that was the whole idea that came behind it. But I just thought, you know, we could relate to that. So I asked Phyllis about it. I said, what do you think about that? And she was like, Oh, I know the importance of genealogy. What's interesting for Phyllis is that she had so many things that didn't quite fit in her mind into her family that she was raised in. She just didn't quite understand why she looked at things differently and was different. And of course it took 44 years to find out exactly why. And so we're blessed to have her here now, but we were saying this other day and we did Tony's Facebook live thing for his art. Cause we got some new art up behind us from Tony. And, uh, you know, when you, she loves to hunt, she loves being outdoors and she never really did any of that stuff growing up because her family was not like that. So now she's kind of getting to redo all that, you know, as an older woman, which is really interesting. So anyway, just I thought it was worth noting, Jace, that we kind of like have a looking, family connection, you know. I like looking at genealogies because when you start thinking of along those lines, you're going to eventually get back to the fundamental human question, how did we get here? <laughs> That's right. Where did that come from? Look, when I look at our genealogy, I mean, I have to really thank my other brother, our other brother, Willie. Now, we're in a golf tournament this weekend, which... I was it, wondering if you played in that. Oh, I played in it. And uh, so me and my partner, my partner's pretty good. So was it was it a two-man? Two-man, four ball, which Phil has no idea what that means. But you play <laughs> your own ball, and your partner plays his own ball, and whoever makes the best score out of you playing, that's what your score is. So I don't know why it's called four ball, actually. But uh, well, so here's what's funny. The people we play with was Willie and one of his buddies. Willie ain't been playing any golf. I ain't been playing much. So, but 
my partner is better than his partner. That's a given. <laughs> well, we go out there and shoot the same score. And now they felt good. They shot 76, which is four over. We felt terrible. I was embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> Neither me nor my partner played good. Well, I think Willie in his mind thought, we can beat them. You know, because we so we so now you got a competition well, seventy six the... and seventy six. So, but there's a day too. Well, so what happened was they they flight this thing. So they have the championship flight. They're all too good. These people practice all the time, and so then we were going to be in the first flight that are the non. You know, these guys should have gone pro, but whatever happened. You know, there's always a story. But they're up there battling for who's the best. So then you have that next tier. Well, we shot so bad that we got bumped down to the next tier. So we're in the second flight. And uh, so we, but since we shot the same score and the way it turned out, we played with Willie again. On day two. So we get out there on the first You're team, like team Rom line. and Cantalay. You got to remember, this is the rules of golf. You know, they, they counted my clubs before I hit. I thought, oh my goodness, which I did. You know, they, and then they grabbed one, which they still have. <laughs> He's like, hey, we saved you from being disqualified. I was like, oh. what did they take? I said, I, I gave him my three iron because I was like, I can't hit it anyway, so I don't know why it's in there. But uh, <laughs> You're only supposed to have 14 clubs. So, look, I, we got up there, fixed the tee off, and Willie's like, I say we put a $5 Nassau on this. And Uh-oh. I said, with who? <laughs> I mean, this what happened yesterday? That miracle that we shot the very worst and you shot the very best? <laughs> That's all I needed. I mean, I was thankful for my genealogy in that moment because <laughs> who cares about the tournament now? I thought the, 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 aud- the audacity to think <laughs> that, that that's fixed to happen again. So long story short, we shot 68. Which felt more eight, like an it. An eight stroke improvement. They shot 74, which was an improvement. And, and honestly, I was shocked that they <laughs> played that good. So I, so so Willie's partner sends me this text. I want you to explain to me what this means. Because I thought about this. I'm glad you brought it up. He said, are you going to be in West Monroe this weekend? Yes. We need a spotter to play with me and Willie Saturday in the pine cone. Yeah. It will be sometime Saturday morning. What does that mean? We need a spotter. Well, because they didn't have an even number of teams. And so there was like when it got – so you play four – people per hole right. well the way the math went up it was too short so they needed somebody to play because they just didn't want to play by themselves but what happened was somebody else dropped out okay and so then we eventually played with them i got you but here's what's funny so i was like play. i haven't played i don't and plus i don't even know what a spotter i don't even well, know trust what that me you, these things are hard you know oh they're I mean, terrible you gotta played, play the ball down oh yeah we played really really good the second day What's so funny is Willie. So they're down, you know, five dollars, and you can press, and it's complicated, you know. But make a long story short, Willie's we, the king of the press. We get to eighteen, and he's twenty bucks down, and so he said, "How about on the last hole, double or nothing? You know, unless we tie, then you owe us twenty. But forty, you know, if we lose the hole, and zero if we win. So like, okay." <laughs> So my partner makes birdie. So Willie, actually, I mean, I have to give him credit. He's got about a 20-footer for birdie, and he made it. So Which then he felt like he won somehow, <laughs> that he lost 20. I was like, go ahead and give me that 20 in your, in your victory walk and your fist pump, which means you lost 20 instead of 40. And so then we went and got wound up getting second in our flight, which means you get paid. And uh, yeah, because that's a pretty big tournament. I oh, mean, it's big. Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was good. Of course, then look. But then everybody thinks you're sandbagged the first day. That, that, look, so I get up there. <laughs> that's why I left. We're waiting around, you know, for the money here. Let's payday. We, we we're in the money. Everybody's happy. I thought. <laughs> no. So this guy I don't know said, "Yeah, boy, that was pretty good to shoot eight strokes better than you did the day before." <laughs> And then his buddy said, yeah, of course, they had had a few adult beverages. <laughs> He's like, I think we got a little hustling going on. I was like, yeah, that's me, the golf hustler. 
<laughs> I said, let me Purposely tell you. Purposely playing bad. I'm going to tell you something. I said, that 76 yesterday, we earned that. <laughs> that was the round. Cause it, but you know, it kills me when people say that, just because do they not watch professional, even professional golfers? I mean, a guy can go out and shoot 62, well, I got, and then the next day he shoots 72. I well, mean, I it got happens news all- for you. When you play the ball down on a course that's not a PGA Tour course, and you hit it a little right or left, the PGA Tour don't have a rock bed in a washout, you know, with three pine cones sitting on your ball, and you got to hit that thing. Or a root wide, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I broke a club. Yeah. Because I hit one, there was a you know a little tree in my way, like on my three swing. Well, I never fool with so, the golf world, so I don't know. Do you, well, do you I don't feel know. like you're missing something? I will start talking about genealogy. Absolutely not. <laughs> I course, love that genealogy led you into Willie. Well, I just thought, <laughs> it just was so shocking to me that they, because we tied one day, that all of a sudden he'd come out there just saying, yeah, y'all want to play us? I was like, yes, I do. <laughs> yeah. Add a zero to that five. Oh, that's classic. Like, no, really. we'll just make it fun, $5. It's okay. just a story of has-beens and washouts <laughs> that, that are just trying and to – And used-to-be's. Just trying to, <laughs> trying to slick somebody. So I tried for the perfect day. Then I went – Let's up, face it, you up. enjoyed taking that $20 more from <laughs> Willie than you did anything to do with that golf tournament. Oh, that's- there's no sweeter money on the planet. <laughs> he's, he's digging into his wallet. Give me that 20, boy. <laughs> so then I go dove hunting, which turned out to be not as good. You know, I love eating doves. Oh, so they're so I'm good. still waiting on that. The That's place, one of the finest eating birds. It is my is. favorite of all fowl. Is, is Tell you, this is no joke. So I go out there. And, uh, of course, I didn't go with the crew, and it's a thousand-acre field, and there was a lot of doves, but I just I could not get one to fly over. What's funny is on the way down here, you know, I passed by Sy's house, and I kid you not, his the power line runs over his door, and the biggest dove I've ever seen, one of those white-winged doves, oh, yeah. was on the power line right above his door. And I thought, that's a sign <laughs> right there. That it's over. There's no threat here. That's right. So I can't wait to tell him. Yeah, it was just sitting there. <laughs> I didn't notice that on the way down here. I was like, well, there he is right there. I need to come hunt Sai's yard. I know. It. I'm hoping somebody will kill some so we can do some. In fact, they uh, real tree on their ad, I mean, on their website the other day, Jace was running different recipes. Yeah. And they had a big old pile of grilled doves that they had bacon wrapped around them. And they put a little cream cheese and jalapeno in there. It was like here's here's what you need to get your fall oh, kicked I'm gonna, up. I'm, I'm, like, oh. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get them. I'm gonna I'm gonna watch. You know, it's funny. We talked a few podcasts ago about uh, Cy and I playing cards together, and since that time we played because he always says I get lucky, and it's always laughable because <laughs> we've done this for years. Speaking of and, genealogy, yeah, <clears throat> and I will say the last time we played, maybe this was a sign or whatever. We get involved in a hand. I mean, this is just a few nights ago. And I have two four, which I realize is not a great hand. It's one of the worst hands you can have. But I was being ambitious. Well, Sai has ten four, which actually technically is a worse hand than two four because at least mine, if an ace of three and you a five a come straight. out, I can hit a straight. Ten four, you should fold always and hold them. I mean, well, what happened was two fours came out for your community cards. There's only four fours in the deck. I'm explaining this for Phil. You got four fours in the deck of cards. I have one. Cy has one. Well, two of them, the other two, came out. Well, so I'm looking down. I'm like, ooh, I got three fours. Well, Cy's looking down. Ooh, I got three fours. Well, the problem is his 10 beats my two. Correct. Unless there's two cards over a 10 out there, which there weren't. And so Sai's over betting the pot, which he normally does. He's just betting huge. And he was he was putting me to a point of where I gotta like either fold or shove all in and get him to fold, which is what I tried to do, which is impossible because he has a four. I mean, I didn't think he had a four because there's only four of them. Because if he does have a four, I'm in trouble. Anyway, I go all in. He's like, Kyle. So we got all our money out there. Well, we turned the cards over, and I'm like, whoops. <laughs> because he actually had a four with a 10. 
So I'm like, mm, I'm I'm actually getting my wallet out to, re- to-, to rebuy because <laughs> I thought, well, he finally got me in a hand, you know. The last card, there's one card to come. Deuce. <laughs> Oh, no. Which gives me a full house, a boat. There was three deuces I could have hit in the deck. When that card came out, it was like all these years, everything Cy has been saying about I'm the luckiest man alive. It was like a it was like a tea kettle <laughs> that the water that that is now ready to pour. He goes off. And I mean, some of the things he said, I think he was trying to say one thing and it came out differently because <laughs> it was worse than PG-13. And I, he lost his mind, for real. He just had a meltdown. <laughs> so after everybody was bewildered and looked, then we laughed for 10 minutes till I thought I was going to pee in my pants. <laughs> but I was like, Si, I got lucky. Sorry. <laughs> now give me that pot. <laughs> It was so funny. I'm gonna have to ask him about it now. Yeah, ask him about the four deuce, which was weird because the only reason I played it because Willie's daughter, that's her bluffing him when we play on vacation. Yeah. She'll just take the four two. Well, why do you pick that? The worst thing possible. And she just acts like it's pocket aces. Yeah. And she tries to bluff with it, which is funny. Which is one of the reasons I played it, because it became a memorable <laughs> And so then I said, Sadie taught me that, Ty. Sorry. <laughs> yep. let's, let's take a break. So, Dad, it's interesting because you and Mom are still in the house that we grew up in. I was 10 when we moved there. So, Jace was only about six. But you're still in that same house, which people find fascinating because they figured you would have built you a big mansion in town and a big subdivision. It, it's just a hoarder's. <laughs> headquarters <laughs> when we're gone whoever wades in there <laughs> but you're right we're still there so you've had a good run in this house and it is full of a lot of mom stuff uh, but you know there unfortunately there are people that are losing their homes because they become a victim of home title theft In your case, your house is paid for, which is a good thing. But other people who have a mortgage somewhere and they have that, you know, title for their house that's somewhere digitally, uh, these people, cyber thieves, they come in, they search for places with high equity, they forge your signature saying you sold your home, and then they take out loans using your equity. So it's a terrible thing what is going on. So we want you to protect your most valuable asset. Register your address now to see if you're already a victim and receive a complete title history of your home, which is a hundred dollar value that you get for free. So go to hometitlelock.com, hometitlelock.com, hundred dollars value free to receive a complete history of your home. Yeah, I might ask him about that. That's pretty All right, funny. I had to share, I had to share that. I don't know. It popped into my head. I thought it was funny, so we clear that. So for the record, I'm saying. I got lucky. You got lucky. <clears throat> but Sai says all your plan is luck. So, But yeah. my point is, if I would have rebought and you play, you know, good card, eventually it, you, you, it would have all made its way few, back. It's not like you never make a mistake. I made a mistake. But reading Sai is impossible. So I don't worry about Sai because I just right. think the longer he sits there, that's to my advantage. That, that's how this works. <laughs> I'm laughing. And they wonder why I've never played a card game. <laughs> no, that's one that got by me. <laughs> you never when find you, yourself in these situations, did you, Dad? <laughs> it's like I was telling that story. The sound effects from Phil's visual was just crickets. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> four, two, funny. ten, four. You don't so, know so Jay's on the last uh, podcast. You had some really interesting stuff about Capernaum because that's where Jesus starts his ministry in Matthew chapter four. And uh, you said there was one more thing you were going to. Well, what I thought was interesting. Look, there was a lot. Because it really was a spiritual versus physical. It was. And you see that in the miracles he did. And that's where he was going public. And you see all this happening in the Roman center. And I mean, and he also, you know, healed Peter's mother-in-law that's in there I mean there was a lot of things happening so you would think with all the miracles that happened there 
this would be the most spiritual city on the planet. Well, what's interesting is when you get to Matthew 11, which we will eventually get to in in more detail, but I just wanted to bring this out because I think there's a fundamental principle that you should never miss when it comes to chasing end time, uh, you know, miracles or answers to your problems, but only from an earthly perspective. Right. That's not what we're about. That's why I went through those those fundamentals about what Jesus represents as far as the heavenly kingdom and that the one who wrote these words is more important on how you view the agreement with other people on what the words were. You got to look at it from a relational standpoint, which was what Jesus was trying to do. And where you look at the answer to the spiritual problems, way more important than the physical. That's why when he when he healed the paralytic, well, the first thing he said, he forgave him his sins, and which just threw the teachers of the law into a conundrum because they're like, well, you're a blasphemer. But he was using a sign to show that he had the authority over the physical and the spiritual. But it's more important to have your sins forgiven, which the cross proved that, and the resurrection, and more important to live again, than to have a temporary stay of physical health. Right. And I think that's what people miss. And I'm going to prove it to you because when he gets to Matthew 11, in verse 20, Jesus began to denounce the cities in which most of his miracles had been performed. So you're like, why is he denouncing the cities where the miracles had been performed? Because they didn't get it. That didn't lead them to him. They were just enamored by the miracles. Right. It's kind of like the idea of the people following him that when he fed the 5,000 for more fish and bread because right. it was really good. Yeah. Then the idea that he has the power to create fish and bread from <laughs> so, nothing. Yeah. They were more concerned about the one meal than the idea yeah. that he was the ultimate. But feeder. you would think this was common sense, but you see it in our modern culture today. People are gathering up and they're still looking for signs. Yeah. <laughs> they're like, well, you have the one who gave the signs available. The Spirit's been poured out, made available. Go get it. They're like, yeah, but I want the sign to show that I can get it. Or I want end so, time signs. Yeah, he, he mentions Tyre and Sidon, but look what he says in 22. Three, two, I think yeah. it's 22. Yeah. But I tell you, it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, yeah, 23. And you... Here it is. I, I've been calling it Capernaum, but you say Capernaum. But either way. Yeah. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the skies? No. You will go down to the depths. Hmm. If the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Sodom. 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 Yeah, I don't know why I said Sodom. It would have remained to this day. But I tell you that it will be more bearable for Sodom on the day of judgment than for you. Whoa. What a statement. Which is, by the way, where I got the idea that this passage is where I got the idea that Jesus knows what would happen if something that didn't happen would have happened. Because that's basically what he said. If the miracles would have been performed here instead of there, then this would have happened. Well, it didn't happen. But he said, but if it did, this would have happened. That's right. Well, how do you know that? <laughs> <laughs> Which goes to my point, his characteristics, his his traits are beyond earthly imagination. Right. I mean, That's right. you, you, can, you can say, oh, yeah, yeah, I get it. So I just thought I wanted to bring that up to say, of all the great things that he did, of all the great stories we did, and all the spiritual principles, they still missed it as a town. Yeah, and as a region. Is that not incredible? It's amazing. It's incredible. And, I mean, he compares it to Sodom, which we know is one of the greatest sites of judgment in all of human history, and especially in biblical history, you know, Sodom and Gomorrah, and what happened to them. And he's saying... If man, if, if we'd have just, if I'd have done what was done here to them, Abraham would have done that back in the day. That's why a, a text that says, and Gabriel was talking to Mary, going back to the beginning of the book of Matthew, 
nothing is impossible for God. Right. Human beings have this zone, this limit. They'll go right up to it, but they won't think nothing is impossible. Well, that's why nothing. That's right. But that's why I feel still have one more thing when we talk about this because I've had some letters. Human beings, all of them say it's impossible. Right. They use that word all the time. It's impossible. Impossible. You say not with God, and they're like, "What are you trying to say?" You say, "We're saying what Jesus is saying." Nothing is impossible for him. Yeah. Well, exactly. Nothing. I mean, look, I had some guy send me a book the other day because it, it basically they're saying, well, what, what's your thoughts on modern day miracles? I'm like, look, God can do whatever he wants to. Now, whether it's supernatural work that you're calling a miracle, because a lot of times we've prayed, we've had hundreds of stories where we prayed and a person was healed, and I believe God worked in their life. Yep. I believe he did it. Now, is that a miracle? We uh, religious people call that a miracle, but a miracle is something that even an atheist would believe. It, it's not nece- necessarily, and I know it's semantics, but I think it's important. It may be the providential work of God, and you think it's a supernatural occurrence. A miracle is what's going on here. We have people being raised from the dead and paralytics being healed. I mean, bodies are being fused and these are things that are impossible. And so if God wants to do that today, well, who am I to say, say no, but I will say this based on what we've read so far, especially in the last two podcasts, that leads you to the miracle worker, to a relationship with him. That's more important. Which is <clears throat> which is the most important. Let's take another break. So one of the things that we've been able to do being a part of our church family for so many years is sort of provide a place where you can give people wise counsel. You know, I, I've seen you do it, Dad, through the years. Jason and I have certainly spent our fair share of just yep. just trying to help people out, you know, that, that need a, a helping hand. One of the things that kind of goes beyond that is uh, actual, you know, trained counselors. And one of our sponsors is a group called Faithful Counseling. Uh, and they really do a nice job because it's an online way uh, to be able to find counseling because you can't always find people don't always have a, a church family with a pastor that you know can really help them or, or some connection to somebody else. So uh, anything you share with these guys is confidential. They have over 3,000 licensed therapists across all 50 states, which is great. You can use desktop, uh, Android, mobile web, video, phone sessions. There's a lot of different ways to be able to do it. Uh, I encourage you, if you're having some uh, some needs for counseling, to check these guys out. Go to faithfulcounseling.com slash unashamed. That's faithfulcounseling.com slash unashamed. And our listeners are going to get 10% off your first month. Uh, from our sponsor. So you go on, you fill out a questionnaire, they assess your needs, they're going to match you with a counselor that you're going to love. Faithfulcounseling.com slash unashamed. Yeah, Jace, it'd be like our old friend Joey Jones, you know, he lost both of his legs in Afghanistan. If if God in his possibilities grew two new legs, we wouldn't have any qualms calling that a miracle. That's a miracle. Like if he came in and it just, bam, two, not not surgeries, not just boom. Two new the, legs. They're back. Well, that's a miracle. Right. Now, if we pray for him and he's healed, but he doesn't have new legs and he finds a way to have prosthetics right. and we're like, God worked in his life providentially. True. It's not a miracle. He. Right. That that's what I was trying to But convey. even your to your point, even if he did that and we marveled at it, if we still miss Jesus and his ability to forgive, well, what would it matter? There's still <laughs> a dead in the road. You would run around, but you wouldn't be lost. Well, it's like that's why I'm saying the people that send letters and look, you're missing the point. It doesn't matter that you believe in modern day miracles as much as it matters if people believe that Jesus is the son of God yeah. to me, we're just wasting time here. Right. You sending me a book about that or a letter about that is a complete waste of time because I'm all for them. I mean, yeah, me it's too. like when somebody asked me about speaking in tongues once upon a time, and look, there's a lot of different interpretations on what that means. You know, some people believe 
that based on what you read in Acts 2, that people were hearing their language in the ears, in their ears from people who had never studied that language, which I think that's what was happening. Mm -hmm. Yep. No well, doubt. That's, that's a miracle. Well, when I go to the Ukraine, I actually prayed that I could speak in tongues. And you said, why did you pray that? Because I couldn't understand what they were saying. <laughs> and I was trying to share Jesus with and them. And they couldn't understand what they were saying. And so I actually prayed. I was like, Lord, <clears throat> I'm ready. Give it to me. Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share Jesus with them. My heart was right. Because I was putting... I wasn't putting the cart before the horse. I was like, I'm going to share Jesus. Well, it never happened. But but he, but he he I met an interpreter who knew Ukraine and English. So I thought, well, it's not a miracle, but I really believe God sent that it, guy. It'll get the job done. It got the job done. I prayed. Who cares on whether, why, why should we sit around in a circle and determine whether that was a miracle or not? Doesn't matter. Now let's go share Jesus with all the Ukrainians so that we can get up in heaven and laugh about how this happened. Right. <laughs> so, but to me, that's my point, and I hope that clarifies, because I get, I get a lot of feedback on that, Yeah. because this is a sore subject with people. You know, they, they're, I don't, I don't know why, I think it's some particular religious groups. They're like, so what are you saying? I'm saying, Jesus is Lord, and he did all this miraculous work in this town, and then he just chastised them, saying, gave you all the miracles, and you Isn't missed there me. a text somewhere that says, blessed are you because you've seen, you believe, but more blessed are the ones who have not seen, but were blessed. That's right. That's, that's what John, he said to Peter. John 20. Yeah. No, John, John, John at <laughs> the end of, yep. in John 20, he said, now, you know, if, you, if it's in the book of John, I mean, that's where I hang out. When he said, I think it's John 20 and verse 30. Jesus yep. did many other miraculous signs yep. in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Oh, I skipped it. It was before that. Uh, verse 29, Thomas said, remember when Thomas said, I won't believe, he said, yeah. all right, I believe my Lord, my God. <laughs> then Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed me. Yeah. You have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Then he yeah. said, Jesus did a, a many other miraculous signs. Yeah, yeah right at the end. Yeah. I, I was yeah. thinking of a different one, but it's similar. The idea is what he told Peter when he said he was the Christ, the son of the living God. He said, blessed are you, Simon, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven, which I thought was pretty interesting because nobody there would have been telling him that because nobody believed it, <laughs> you know? Well, it's like the last podcast. I told about this snake was inches away from me. Now, if that snake bites me, it's probably an out. Well, I guess if you were not going the speed limit, 35 minutes to the hospital. So barring a miracle... Probably be dead. Test one that big. Yeah, because he was a three footer. So you you know, if the snake would have would have bit me, you say, Well, what are you gonna do? There's a verse in there that says you can handle deadly snakes and won't be hurt. Well, that's true. So <laughs> if God decided to do that in that moment, great. I wouldn't say, oh, no, God can't do it because it's more important to put your faith in Jesus. But to me, so if that didn't happen, then what's going to happen? I'm going to die, and then I'm going to be resurrected. So guess what? I still won. And I can guarantee you, I, I don't know that you would have died, but I can guarantee you would have swole up. Because well, yeah. every time I've seen a, a cottonmouth bite, anything i just look at my dog the dog is what i was thinking well about. i'm just saying you can take this to a point well you know put your tennis shoes on <clears> and just walk from one end of your property to the other looking up i will guarantee you by the time you get to the end you're going to need medical assistance just about <laughs> you have to watch where you step down in each <laughs> no that's why i said look up <laughs> and just walk <laughs> I'm telling you, you ain't going to make it. <laughs> Stone told me he jumped up on top of a blind the other day that they were brushing a blind, and a couple of them big old red wasps got him. 
zapped him. I said, boy, it made you mad too. He said, oh, there's nothing worse than just getting a couple but of... But you think about it, Al, what, what led to this in Matthew 4, we just covered the temptation of Jesus, and one of the issues was, Jesus' response was, don't put the Lord God to, to the test. test. That's right. That's right. I mean, don't come up with a scenario. I, I, just, I just don't like it when we gather up at a religious setting and we're having great worship and then the guy comes out and said you know are you ready for a miracle today i, I would rather you say you know are you ready for jesus today ready to see or, jesus though. the the miracle leads us to jesus so at least if you're gonna say that clarify but yeah. what they usually say is then they define the miracle and they'll say you know we're gonna tear down some walls in your life we're gonna start out well i'm like well none of these things were miracles he does that <laughs> that's right that's just his supernatural work <laughs> that's right i mean call it a pet peeve but i'm like gee whiz can we not figure out how to communicate this because i don't want to make it less appealing to the world because they're reading their bible and that's why i brought this up about capernaum i mean to me it's just so stunning that he said that after all this stuff had happened there, you would have thought that had been the greatest, most fired up place in the world. Well, it makes you wonder. Let's take another break. It makes you wonder when we get back to our text in Matthew 4, 18, because Matthew is going to tell about the early disciples. He, he mentions the four, the four fishermen. Well, what I was going to say before you read that was, I think it makes you realize that verse 17, when he said, repent, it's just hard to repent. Yeah. You know, Which you see did. something spectacular and this guy is representing heaven and he's doing miracles. And but when you're like, well, that means you got to start changing how you think and where you go and what you do and how you live. And, uh, you know, you fast forward to Matthew 11 where he's like, hey, Sod Sodom is going to be better off than you. Well, these people didn't want to repent. And well, look, People now don't want to either. It's, it's not easy. And remember, not only was it talking about just a changed life that repent, which is what that word means, but the, their view of the kingdom had yeah. to change too. That's right. Because they saw it only as an earthly kingdom, talking about earthly versus spiritual. They saw it as a setting of the preeminence of Israel forever. And by the way, there's still a lot of people that are still hanging right there on that one thing about physical Israel being the preeminent as oh, if yeah. that's the purpose of the kingdom. It changes your ancestry, your whole life. You know, we're talking about genealogy. You know, your family's believed a certain way. It's just hard to come in there in Jesus and say, you know what, I'm changing how I think. And because to me, that's been of all the people I've studied with. It seems to be the biggest problem with people not coming to Jesus is they're like, well, if I embrace this, that means my family or my ancestry. They were mistaken. Were mistaken. And people don't want to, they don't want to deal with that. Right. And it's understandable. But I think that's what part of this is. Yeah, I think you're right. And it's hard to, and it's, it's like you said, it's not easy to do. Which is why Change Jesus. Is hard. Yeah, which is why Jesus went around with the riffraff and the broken and the outcast, and which leads us to the calling of his first disciples of fishermen, which still, look, if somebody, when we, we were fishermen, We'd been on the bank and somebody come down and said, Hey, y'all come follow us. I'd have been like, <laughs> Where? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, this ain't much, but it's something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just to pick up and take off, right? Well, I mean, so I've, that was I've seen more than one that just watched us when we were down there baptizing <laughs> people. And look, they're like this. They just shake their heads. Hey, <laughs> it's a bunch. Well, Phil, they're still shaking their heads. I know. You know. <laughs> <laughs> They're still wondering. Yeah. Well, I just thought it was interesting. What did they think? Now we know that Andrew and and Philip were John the Baptist's disciples. We know that from was it John? Yeah. And so they already had kind of an idea about what this was about. And then so I think they were probably present, at least whenever John said, This is the Lamb of God, the one we've been waiting on. So Andrew, first thing he does is goes and tells Philip, I mean, tells Peter about it because he's thinking, you know, obviously Peter's got some abilities that he's thinking this would be, I mean, he would be just right for that. Plus, you think about it, you're out there the way they live, and somebody just comes along and say, look, they've they, they got this guy, 
he's, he's right up here where they saw him yesterday. And and there's something about the way he talked. It started out like somebody's out here that's among us that we've, we we don't know what, what this is all about, but they, they're beginning to say, well, some even saying he's the Messiah. Yeah. You know, what? You he's know, healing people. Where, where is he from? Yeah. And they start talking. I said, wait a minute. And I could see how they were sort of slow because if somebody walked up to me and, you know, I've never read anything about him and they started telling me about this guy who goes around and large crowds are beginning to follow him, I would be a little suspect. Yeah. Wouldn't you? Oh, absolutely. And that's what I was thinking. I wonder how much they were influenced by what they were hearing about Jesus how much did they actually see? Because they're from this region too. They weren't seeing at first. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I just wonder what they knew. We know from John, or no, it's Luke, Luke five, that you get a more little more detailed account of how Peter came. Remember, he was he asked Peter if he could push out on his boat a little bit to be up so this audience could hear him, and so Peter's just listening to what he says, and then of course that's when they have the miraculous catch. You know, he says, "Throw your nets out." And so they caught all those fish. And of course, James and John were over there too. So that you know, he just tells the story, Matthew. But what really happened was it was a miracle catch, yeah, that got their attention. But do well, you remember Peter's response? And now they're looking over at the one who was doing the talking. And they're like, so they've been listening to him talk. Them and a lot of fish. The creator <laughs> of fish, he he he's just pulled one off here, and it has a way of. Impacting but people. to Jason's point about repentance, isn't it interesting that Peter's response to the miracle was, go away from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Yep. In other words, well, I'm not worthy. I don't even need to be in your company. I don't even need to be here. That's exactly right. Because Which uh, is the ultimate repentant thought. Yep. Well, which goes back to the point I was trying to make. If you're pursuing the miracles, you don't realize that God uses the brokenness and the emptiness and the wreck of your life to get your heart in a position to where you're like, oh, I, I I can't do this, which is what we learned in Romans. I mean, that was one of the foundational principles because to the world's perspective, they go to a meeting and you're, you're promising all these miracles. They're looking at their life or like, well, it doesn't happen good to happen to me. Yep. But that's what you, sh that's where you should hang out because that gives you the platform to realize how much you need Jesus because you've made a mess of yourself. Right. I think it's a more realistic If way. I'm just connected to the miracle worker, I feel pretty good about it. Exactly. You know? I'm like, I'm with him. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, well, has he done a miracle for you today? No, but I guarantee you when I die, I'm going to need that one miracle. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's why I always tell people as a joke because they're like, do you believe in miracles? I'll, I'll say, I believe in at least one. I will come back from the dead. And that's a biggie. Yeah. <laughs> well, and uh, let's take our last break. I do think it's interesting that Abraham is called the father of the faithful. Because these are these men are in faith leaving what they know. You know, it, it was it any easier for them to walk away from the nets as it was for Matthew to walk away from the tax booth? That's what he knew. Yeah, the, the bloodline and the seed line is followed all the way from Genesis. That's right. All the way to Mary and Joe, what we're looking at, Matthew. And so the reason I brought up Matt, I mean, uh, Abraham is because in Genesis 12, God told Abraham, he said, take your family and go to a place that I'll tell you about when you get there, that you're at the place. And Abraham got his people together and took off. And so that same covenant that was made with him is the same one we're seeing here with Jesus. And he goes mm -hmm. to these men and he says, come and follow me. And yep. you're right. He didn't give a lot of explanation about what we we're going to be doing. Well, yeah. I think there's two important principles here. Number one is I think it's more important that to realize Jesus is pursuing us than we are pursuing him mm. because he, that was what he did. He said, come follow me. But in a lot of religious settings, it's all about, well, you need to, you know, pursue him. But if you share more about him pursuing you, that's the proper motivation. The second thing is everybody talks about what is their calling when it comes to church and, and religion. Well, they just happen to be fishermen. So he said, I will make you fishers of men. 
But he said the same thing in Matthew 9 when he got to the farmers. I mean, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. And the Lord uh, asked the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And my point is, whatever you do, that becomes your platform. You're right. fishermen, you're fishers of men. Once Jesus, you realize Jesus is pursuing you. If you're a farmer, guess what you become? Farmers for men. If you're an accountant, you're an accountant for men. You, that That's how this worked, which I think would clear up all these people looking around saying, well, I just don't know. I'm waiting on my calling. Well, Jesus, he pursues you, and then you use whatever you're, you, you do to become that for men. Right. For Jesus. Right. And and it doesn't take away. It makes everything else secondary. So, I mean, we grew up fishing. It was work. We enjoyed it. We we still like to eat fish. But when Jesus was number one, fishing or anything else was never going to be above that. That's it. So I think that's the mindset. You know, that mm-hmm. it, Jesus is always above whatever it is you enjoy, whatever it is you're good at, whatever. I mean, as long as he's where he's supposed to be. And it did work out for the best. It did. That's why he said that time in John where he said the work of God. Man, when he said him and the Father have been working and I'm working now, and he's like the work of God is to believe in the one yeah. he sent. Right. And so it doesn't, when you look at all the work that people do, you can always find the same process, whether it's fishing, farming, accounting, just pick anything. Right. The same process happens to achieve something but you're doing it for men out of loyalty to Jesus. That's yeah. why he said, you know, in Ephesians, he created beforehand good works for us to do in Christ Jesus. Right. It, it's the same yeah, when I put out concept. The, when I put out the thousand hooks on the state line road between Arkansas and Louisiana, Arkansas to the north, Louisiana to the south, that road, there is one between the two states. I put my trot lines out there. I needed uh, about you know six hundred dollars worth of fish. I caught a thousand dollars worth of fish. Just set the hooks out. They were biting. They With were no hitting, bait, right? They were hitting the hooks and getting caught without baiting the trot line. <laughs> but when I when I baited it, I never left it until the boat was almost sinking. And the two guys with me were were not Christians. I, but I told them, I said, before I ever put them out, I said. The Almighty's with us, boys. I said, we, 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 we gonna, you're going to see what's fixing to happen right here. <laughs> I believed it. Yeah. Supernatural, providential work of God. It wasn't a miracle, right? I just looked at it, and I said, thank <laughs> you, Lord. Now, they were jumping up and down saying, we've never seen anything like this so what in our been entire a life. Huh? What would have been a miracle there? I guess a miracle would have been if they would have, Falling from the sky, <laughs> or maybe just all jumped into yeah, the boat. Right. Oh yeah, they Rain, all jumped fish. in the boat. Yeah. All I know is I went back. I had the ice in my truck, like I was going to catch them. I believed I was, and then and the ice. Was, I got the fish, and it took a while to get the fish from the boat to get them loaded over. And I had a big, big, whole truckload, big old ice box. I drove down at it. Well, now we actually have the flying cart. Yeah, oh, yeah. You know, the jump in the boat. I mean, even the guy at the fish market said, those are some pretty catfish. Where would you catch him? I said, up on the Arkansas line. He said, man, we needed them. So was, uh, this was backwater or something that had gotten on backwater this road? Backwater was falling out in yep. about July, a little earlier than right So what, here's what I find interesting about that story. So you're a new Christian. Probably. It was either dog luck, a miracle, of just God said This was within the first five years of your Christian walk. That's right. right. So, or providential. What I'm saying, it was a supernatural providential work. It was a lot of fish God. in a hurry. I've never done it before. Or but since here's what I love about it. On a trot line. So it was, but you had faith because you went prepared yep. for what God was going to do. So you had faith. And you did some work. And you did some hope. work. A lot of work. You put the stuff out. And you had knowledge because you knew when back was falling out, you had a good chance of catching fish. So you put all that together, what you're naturally good at, you have some things you know, you're willing to jump in with both hands, but ultimately you trust in God, that's how you operate your life. I mean, to me, that's like the whole it's purpose not of too everything. It's far right? off from Peter and him catching the big load. Well, I caught the big load. More than that, from time to time, I'd get a big load. But that particular deal was pretty eye-catching, even for me. But, I was like, I, I mean, was people like, wow. say that about me, they're like, well, you're just lucky. 
Yeah. Yeah. Just like, like that hand, just like the fours and deuces. Like like <laughs> one of them said, uh, <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> one of them, one of the guys said, Hey, you talking about dog? Look, because we've been fishing. They wanted me to fish on up the way. But when I got to where I was going, I said, No. I said, I don't like the color of the water. I, I went on down two miles below there. But when I got in there, I said, This is it right here. But that's my point. Almost if you're I was in guided Jesus, in there. Look, if you're in Jesus, you're going to be extremely lucky. He said, <laughs> That's right. he said, you talk about <laughs> the lucky. Best of luck. And I said to him, one of them, I said, I'll take it. <laughs> and right. my point is, look, so you're resurrected. You're you're coming back from the dead. Your body is being changed to imperishable. And the guy who didn't believe is standing beside you. And he's like, you lucky dog. As I'm leaving. That's right. He's like, you talking about lucky. <laughs> That's right. That's what's going to happen. But Same see, I, but I always, when I talk about it, our, our early years, I always put it in a faith context. I say the way we lived was the th same way the Israelites, when they got out of Egypt, they left slavery. God took them out. And then they depended on him, begrudgingly in their case, but they depended on him to provide for them. So that manna would fall down every night. But he said, don't get two basketfuls, get one. And I, I always said the same thing about us fishing. It seemed like we got just enough to make it. So it was like we kept having to trust in God because if we ever thought it was you or us, yeah, we would miss out. Yeah, you say, well, well you can't set a trot line out with hooks hanging down in the water, and before you bait them, you're not going to catch any. You think well, you never fish, catch any? They were biting the bear hooks. That's right. Now, I had baited well, them the night before fishing on down the way, but I hadn't caught much. Well, you might have been much. snagging. I hit about five strikeouts in a row. But when I got there on that roadbed, they started biting bare hooks. And I said, well. Hey, I snagged a two-pound crappie yesterday out of Willie's Pond. <laughs> and guess what? He tasted just the same. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Nothing is impossible. Well, what I wanted to say Close is out there. In, in the end of John 4, he goes through his ministry about he's teaching in the synagogues. He's preaching the good news of the kingdom. This is in verse 23. He's healing diseases in verse 24. All those suffering from severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, those who have been paralyzed, he healed them and large crowds were following them. And it leads us up to a mountain in chapter 5. All these miracles and signs of, of freeing people from demons and healing physical ailments led to a sermon where he starts off talking about the greatest spiritual qualities that you can possess which is my point. He's more concerned about your heart and your spiritual makeup than what happens on the outside. But that gets your attention. <laughs> That's right. Which will be the platform of where we go off. Greatest the, sermon ever preached. The spiritual map to Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount. Thanks for listening to the Unashamed Podcast. Help us out by rating us on iTunes. And don't miss an episode by subscribing on YouTube and be sure to click that little bell to get notified about new episodes. And for even more content that you won't get anywhere else, subscribe to Blaze TV at blazetv.com slash unashamed.